Thank you very much. Thanks for the uh, invitation and thanks to the organizers for putting together such a nice workshop. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, learning. So I think I've got almost all the words from the title of the, of the workshop. So I'm going to talk about uh, learning with optimizers and how can you make these optimizers be uh, differentiable, something we all like right now, uh, with a perturbation method. So this is, if this works. This is joint work with uh, many people. So these are based on some ideas uh, that we exchanged last year when I visited Francis Pack uh, at INRIA for a few months and with uh, a lot of my colleagues at uh, Google. And uh, the preprint is uh, now online. So you can also look it up. Okay, so this is I think the slide that we're going to see uh, many, many times uh, at, uh, at this workshop. Um, so how a lot of machine learning uh, works these days uh, so at least for supervised learning, where you have some uh, inputs and a desired uh, response uh, yi, so you have a, a lot of these couples, uh, and you have some model in the middle, and you would like to tune uh, this model a little bit so that the answers uh, look like what you expect. Right, so the goal is to optimize the parameters of a big model like this. You have some loss, um, and uh, most of the ideas uh, around optimizing a, a model like this, so this can be you know, a simple model, this can be a linear model, this can be a very complex uh, deep neural network. Uh, whatever you do, the workhorse in general for optimizing this method is at, at least at some point to compute gradients of the loss and how they depend on uh, W, the parameters of the or weight uh, of the model. And then at the time there's some uh, auto differentiation, back propagation that happens, right? To uh, to propagate uh, the gradients of the loss to all the parameters. So a problem that uh, we wanted to look at uh, in this work was what happens if you have some non-differentiable operations uh, in this big block. Um, so here I have non-differentiable with a asterisk. In particular, we were concerned with operations where the gradient is almost all the time zero and then sometimes the function jumps, right? So the, with locally constant functions. So uh, how could this happen? I'm gonna show a bunch of examples. Um, so we were concerned with situations like this. Essentially, so you have um, a big, uh, big input X, you have a, a large model uh, GW that, you know, in the blue box, everything is differentiable. You have some uh, output, so maybe, you know, your log it or something like this, uh, theta. And then you have a non-differentiable operation uh, that happens uh, on uh, theta, so you obtain y star of theta. And in particular, we wanted to look at situation where y star gave you the solution of an optimization problem that depends on theta. Uh, and that had some discrete outputs, right? So this would be something that would be uh, uh, locally constant. So I'm gonna uh, make some drawings and show some drawings uh, in the next few slides. Uh, but some natural examples of something like this. Uh, well, the first one would be uh, Y star uh, returns a one hot vector uh, with a one where you have the maximum theta. Right? This is something that you would very naturally have in, um, in, uh, in classification. Um, so I think this is, yeah, this is my last example here. Um, so you have a Y that's a one hot, right? So there's a one uh, that corresponds to the class of the actual example that you're seeing. Uh, and here you've created a layer that takes all of these thetas and returns a one hot where you have the largest uh, theta. Right? And you have a loss between these two. That's one way of doing classification. It's not how it's done in practice, but if you were to write it naively, uh, maybe you would do it like this. Um, there are other operations that can happen at some point. So you know there's uh, operations based on ranking. So this is something where maybe you have the, the score for K products based on features that you see a user has. Uh, and uh, Y star would be the ranks uh, of these thetas, right? So you know, the coordinates are maybe in order five, two, four, three, one. 
this is what this returns, and you compare this to the ranking that the user has given you, at least in, the, in this training set. You can do other examples, so we're gonna see other examples. Uh, shortest path between two points, depending on cost that you have for edge, et cetera, et cetera. Essentially, anything where you can have, you know, a cost or reward of an optimization problem that you pass uh, through this layer. Um, and the big problem, if you have something like this, is that it breaks auto-differentiation. Right, so you know you could talk about gradients going in this direction, etc. But more uh, more conceptually, maybe what I mean is that if I move a tiny bit uh, the weights here in W, and this moves a tiny bit uh, the the um, this moves a tiny bit uh, the vector theta, then a lot of the time it's not going to move at all this vector. Right, and this is a big problem. A lot of the uh, a lot of the idea in optimizing these uh, optimizing these uh, functions is essentially that you move a tiny bit uh, the parameters and you see how this affects the, the loss. If essentially it never you know never changes the loss and then suddenly it changes it discontinuously, uh, this is really bad news uh, for um, for optimization for machine learning. So of course in the classification case there are known methods. How do you do something else? here than taking a one hot. Uh, and what we wanted to do was have a sort of general method that doesn't require, uh, you know, ad hoc new technique every time that you have a black box, an optimization black box of this type. Okay? And so you would want the whole block here, the whole pipeline to be end-to-end -end differentiable. And this is something that, you know, you do not have if you have a, uh, something like this. Okay, so going to talk a bit about uh, convex analysis. Do I have some chalk? Yeah, yeah, lots of chalk. And I'm gonna make drawings over there, I think, because this is where you can see them a little bit. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to uh, show this here so that at least we can have it all the time. Right? So you have you know, a situation where you have a convex set C. Uh, and you have a vector theta, right? So I'm going to uh, represent Rd here, and uh, so this is where the, the vector theta can be, and this is uh, the convex set C on the other side. So the idea is that if theta is in this, if theta is in this sector, uh, then the solution is going to be here, right? So these are the notations, and uh, f of theta is the value, right? So it's a piecewise uh, linear function, and locally, uh, its gradient almost everywhere uh, is y star, right? So you can think of this as, you know, if you try to map uh, the maximum of this set uh, in, uh, in here, it will be linear uh, in each of these quadrants, and in each of these quadrants, right, so in this one, the gradient would be equal to this, uh, in this one, the gradient would be equal to this, and on and on, right? So now if you look at the function y star, uh, locally, it would be constant, right? So if you, if you do a slice of this, right, so you would have have something like this for f of theta, and you would have something like this for y star of theta, schematically, right? And so you can't really uh, take at least informative uh, derivatives of y star of theta. So how do we change this problem a little bit so that we don't have this sort of issue. Well, one of the ideas, there's probably many different ways of doing it, but one idea that we found simple to analyze and to implement was to do this with perturbation. Right? So we change a little bit the optimization problem. And what we do is we add noise to the vector theta. Right? So you see this little bubble around the vector theta. This means that we can add noise with uh, amplitude Epsilon, right, that we call the temperature, that measures how much noise we add. 
Um, and when we add noise, this means that sometimes the solution can be uh, at another point, right? So you see in this particular example, if you have one instance of theta plus epsilon z that's a bit uh, to the north, then uh, y star is suddenly in another, in another place, right? And so you have you know, mass in red that corresponds to the probability uh, that we have a solution at each of these points. And when you average them all, uh, you have this y epsilon star, right? So this is a, what we call the perturbed or soft uh, maximizer. Uh, and it is, a, it is a function of, epsi of uh, theta para with a parameter epsilon, and it, it's going to have an, a lot of nice properties that we really enjoy. So I'm going to write it as well. So I'm introducing a bunch of notations. Right, so we have y star epsilon of theta. That's the expectation of the argmax. And it's going to be important. It's, it's also the gradient of this soft maximum or perturbed maximum, right? So, morally, in this uh, 1D slice, what happens is that we have F epsilon that is above, that is strictly convex and smooth like this, right? Some sort of stochastic smoothing has happened on uh, F epsilon. Yeah, so I'm, j I'm just going to finish this and then uh, get back to you on it. Uh, and Y epsilon does something like this. And I think Arnak has a question. I just, I think it's a typo, right? Yeah. First expectation you have. Possibly. Plus, yes, yes, yes. Ah, okay, so here there should be, of course, plus epsilon z. Thanks a lot, Arnak. So it's my first time giving this presentation, so I, I hope a uh, lot of typos will be catched. Are there any other questions? Yeah. It's positive, but the noise you add makes it always positive. No, no, not necessarily. Uh, but we, because we take the maximum, it's always going to be above. But this can be anything. Uh, conceptually, uh, what we're going to ask is that the, it has a density that's uh, regular and that it has full support. Essentially, it puts noise smoothly everywhere. That way we make sure that you know, every extreme point has some mass, maybe even a tiny bit. OK, thanks. Other questions? Yeah? Yeah, yeah. So uh, Mathieu, one of my co-authors on this paper, will give a, will give a, um, a presentation of a, about another problem where we uh, a specific problem of ranking where we consider projections. Um, projections, I think, you have to do a bit things uh, ad hoc in some sense every time. Right? The projection operation, how it's how it's differentiable in particular. It's kind of you know very problem dependent. Here, uh, everything can be very abstract, right? In some sense, C can be uh, any uh, convex hull of these uh, of these discrete uh, operations, etc. Also, a lot of the time, uh, the problem that we have, so right, so here this is true. If there's no <laughs> if there's no epsilon, uh, the problem actually writes itself like this, and not as a projection directly. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, this is what we've defined, and this is kind of a you know smoothed uh, a smoothed uh, optimizer. Uh, given the given what I've drawn over there, uh, it looks like it has some nice properties. It looks like it's you know close to the original optimizer and differentiable, uh, and this turns out to be true. Okay. Uh, another thing before that. Uh, so we have, uh, this generates, you know, if you look at uh, the mass it puts on all of the extreme points, this uh, generates a natural model, and this is actually something that other people had uh, considered before, in particular uh, in economics. So this is something that uh, models optimal decision under, under uncertainty, uh, and this is, I think, called the random choice models. Uh, so the idea is, you know, of course, if you take a course in uh, microeconomics, people tell you, you know, you, you know your utility function and you behave 
optimally according to your known utility function, etc. But we notice, of course, that people don't all behave the same way, and people sometimes behave a little bit uh, irrationally. So one of the ways to model this is to say, well, people, you know, people take optimal decisions, but they don't really know what they want. Uh, and so one of the ideas is to say, well, you know, imagine as an example here, so I'm going to talk about the shortest path problem. So they don't know how much time it takes to go from one place to the other. They have some vague idea, but it's noisy. Uh, and they take the shortest path according to this idea, right? If this idea is random, then the shortest path that they're going to take is random as well. So this is a nice way, I think, to, uh, to model what happens when there's either uncertainty or you know, changing costs. Uh, and it, it's a very natural model. Um, of course, the problem is that you know, this expression that I wrote, the probability uh, that you are uh, that the solution is at any of these extreme points uh, of C is very hard to write. In general, there won't be a very nice closed formula for it, but the upside is that it's very easy to sample from, right? which is kind of a, the complete opposite of the Gibbs distribution, which is very easy to write and very hard to sample from. Um, it's also related to things that have been, consi that have been considered in a, uh, approximate uh, inference in Gibbs model and in, uh, and in online learning, so in follow the perturbed leader. Right, so in this model, of course, the expectation of the random variable is the soft maximizer that we're considering, right? So the one that would be in the middle over here. So here is an example. So we're going to have uh, the last experiment I'm going to present is going to be based on that, but I think it's very illustrative. Um, so imagine that you have some, so some features xi. And these features generate cost theta, right? So this is the co travel cost it takes to go over one of these uh, uh, sub-images, parts, of the, uh, parts of the images. Uh, so if you solve the shortest path problem uh, on these costs, it will give you this solution. And I think, you know, with the yellow point here, it will also be an optimal solution, both are optimal. Uh, and if you add a bit of noise, right, so with with temperature 0 0.5 to these costs, and you solve many, many times uh, the shortest path problem, and you average, this is what you obtain. And if you add even more noise, uh, then this is what you obtain, right? It diffuses even more. It keeps avoiding uh, the rock and the lake uh, in the middle, because apparently this is uh, really, really bad in this model. Uh, but it explores a bit more, and it takes a bit more uh, the averages uh, of what you're looking at, right? So these points are these uh, y epsilon. Um, for more illustration, for more mathematical illustration, there's one example that's very easy to analyze and to write up. It's what happens over the unit simplex, right? So the uh, convex hull of the uh, canonical basis, the, one, the vector of probabilities, uh, with Gumbel noise set, right? So I haven't written what the density of the Gumbel is. It's not really important. Uh, what is important is that if you add uh, some, uh, if you add some Gumbel noise to a vector theta, uh, then the probability that any i is the highest uh, corresponds to the Gibbs distribution on the theta i. Right. So what this means is that if you take this function, right, so this linear, uh, this maximum of the linear form over the simplex, it's the same thing as taking the maximum in i of the theta i's. Uh, if you soften uh, this function with this sort of perturbation, what you have here is the log sum exp. Right? So you can think of this f as the uh, log sum exp. The probability that you obtain on the extreme points of the simplex is the Gibbs distribution. right? So theta scalar ei is uh, theta i. And uh, the mean, right? So the mean, in, because you're taking the average of uh, the uh, uh, vectors ei, is the same thing as the probability. It will be the exponential weight, right? So this is, and here you can see, you know, if one of the theta i's is very large, then it will dominate, and the vector here will be very close to uh, the actual vector with a one uh, and all uh, other coefficients very close to zero, which is what you get if you don't add any perturbation. Okay, so now that we have all of these, uh, all of these examples, what's, uh, what are some nice uh, properties of this model? Well, 
one of the first one is that it has some nice link with regularization. So it's, it's something that's been exploited already, uh, in particular in online learning, which is that if you perturb uh, a, linear prog a linear program and take averages, it's equivalent to regularizing your uh, linear program. Right, so here, what happens is that if we take the dual of this function, right, so the dual of this soft uh, value function, uh, it's defined on the, do it's, it has for domain C, uh, and what happens is that the solution uh, Y epsilon of this regularized problem is the same as the expectation of the solution under the random model. Right, so what this means over here, sorry, is that if we, right, so if we, if we've added some noise and we have a bit of mass here, which means that we have some y star epsilon of theta here, there is some sort of convex regularization such that the linear, the regularized linear objective looks like this, that is minimized at y epsilon. Right, so that's going to be very useful uh, to obtain some properties uh, of this soft minimizer. Uh, and here you can see, so you can see what happens, you know, if here this is on the simplex, if there is no noise or no regularization, you know, one of the extreme point is solution, and add, as you add a bit more noise or regularization, the expectation or the minimizer of the regularized objective will be here, and here, and here, and when if silent becomes very large, you just go to the, uh, you just go to the, uh, to the center. Um, so this is, this is just a consequence of uh, duality. So when you write duality between uh, epsilon omega and f epsilon, and the fact that y epsilon is the gradient of this, right? So because the max, if you just have the max, this is equal to f epsilon of theta, then by, you know, Fenchel duality, yeah, just a minute, uh, the, uh, um, the argmax will be the gradient of this function. Yeah? So the regularization is just a convex function or is it a strongly convex function because it can have a strong It's a strongly convex function. These are one of the nice properties that's going to pop out of this. I guess uh, also so that it stays, I'm gonna just write this property. And we don't, I mean, except in very simple cases, we don't ever actually compute it. Uh, it's just the fact that it exists is going to be, uh, the fact that it exists is going to be convenient to derive some uh, properties. But, you know, in, in simple cases over the simplex with Gumbel noise, uh, we know that uh, this soft uh, value function is the log sum exp, and so omega would be the entropy. Uh, and here we have some sort of generalization of the entropy, also a function that blows up, whose gradient blows up at the boundary, um, just like the entropy, and that has a lot of these properties as well. It's just that it comes from perturbations, uh, it comes from some expectation of a complicated uh, problem, and so you can't always write it down, you just know that it exists. Um, and so, you know, this schematic drawing uh, that I did is actually true in practice, I mean, in theory, uh, when, uh, and in practice as well. When uh, epsilon goes to zero, uh, if you have a unique maximum for this particular theta, then y epsilon star converges to uh, the true maximum, right? So this means that in this drawing here, uh, the two parts, uh, converge towards uh, this piecewise linear, uh, piecewise constant function. And when epsilon goes to infinity, the only part that dominates uh, is the noise or the regularization, and you just converge to the minimizer of the, um, to the minimizer of the regularization, right? So here in this case, it would be the entropy, and you would be in the middle of the simplex. And we also have some non-asymptotic results. Okay, so, this is just, a no, and this is something that had been highlighted in the online literature before uh, by Abernathy and some co-authors uh, in, uh, in essentially in understanding what stochastic smoothing and regularization smoothing uh, have in common. 
Okay, so what this means is that we have some nice mirror map, some nice essentially bijection between, uh, if, so if C has full interior and Z has smooth density, right, and so every extreme points get some positive mass, uh, we have a nice bijection between all the thetas in RD and all the points uh, in C. Uh, and so going in one direction will be taking the gradient of uh, F epsilon and going in the other direction will be taking the gradient of its dual, which is omega, which we never explicitly compute, but ju we just know it's there and it has some nice properties. Uh, and so if, you know, hope I'm not going to mess this up. Yeah, okay, so if, see if theta moves a little bit, uh, why epsilon uh, will move a little bit and we're able to understand how this happens. And you know, if theta would need to go to infinity for this to go close to the boundary. Essentially, you need, you know, the maximizer to be very, very strong uh, for the soft maximizer to be very close, right? So the uh, infinity is mapped to the boundary of, uh, of this convex set. Okay, so all of this is nice. Uh, it's gonna have some practical applications. In particular, if we observe, if we observe a lot of uh, IID solutions uh, of this problem and we're able to take an empirical average, if the empirical average is close to this one, this will mean that our estimated theta hat is close to the true theta. And so this is why uh, I'm, I'm talking about uh, all these things. And we have, so there was one question about this, right? So we have uh, strict convexity and smoothness of F epsilon, which corresponds to uh, omega being strongly convex, and uh, Legendre type. So Legendre type means it actually blows up at the boundary, right? So there's a true bijection between all of RD and all of this set. Um, and so finally, another thing that's important and that makes all of this framework very useful and one of the reasons why we consider perturbation rather than uh, projection uh, or regularization directly uh, is that not only is the function smooth in the input, right? So y and f, y epsilon and f epsilon are smooth in the input, but they have derivatives that we can actually express as nice simple expectations. So itself, y epsilon uh, can be written as an expectation. It's also the gradient of f epsilon. And by nice integration by part tricks, uh, so this is also something that had been uh, noticed in the uh, online learning literature, we can write these as expectation of the value, right? And so this is related to just uh, something in the density of the noise, right? So this is something that we can know. So if we, if we have some theta and we want to compute, uh, and we want to compute this, we can either average a lot of these things or take a lot of these values and multiply by the gradient of uh, the density. We can also compute the Jacobian of theta, the Jacobian of y uh, in theta, and this is also something that can be expressed just as a function of the solutions. So this means that the perturb maximizer is never locally constant, right? It's, the, it, it never becomes completely flat, and this function is, all, is strictly convex, it never becomes uh, locally linear. Okay, so why do we care again about these things? Uh, well, I had this picture of what happens if we have a big machine learning pipeline with, in some point, uh, a block that takes a discrete operation. Well, what we're saying is you can always if this discrete operation corresponds to taking the optimal of a linear program, you can always change it slightly in a y epsilon star, and then have this whole thing be end-to-end -end differentiable. Uh, so, you know, this is well known when you're taking the max and you're saying, well, here I should have the soft max instead, uh, and the whole thing becomes differentiable, but this just generalizes this and explains how you can take random gradients of this. Uh, and if you have labels that are solution of optimization problems, so it doesn't need to be one hot, it can be ranks, it can be shortest paths, these are going to be the uh, experiments I'm going to show, but it could be anything. Uh, then with just a small modification of this problem, we've shown that we haven't deviated too far from the original uh, model, and the whole thing uh, becomes nicely end-to-end -end differentiable. So this is a little bit of the why. So, this is this idea that if we have 
any function of the weights that says, you know, it's a, a loss of the soft maximizer uh, with theta that depend on W, uh, then we need to compute these sorts of gradients. Right? We, we're going to have to multiply with other gradients and Jacobians, et cetera, to do the full back prop, but this is at least something we need to understand. We need to understand what happens if we move theta a little bit here, how does the soft maximizer move? And the how? So you could say, you know, well, you've introduced all of these things, but you haven't really told us how you can compute any of them. Well, they're defined as expectations, right? So you can just do Monte Carlo estimates. In general, you're going to apply them in cases where, you know, they correspond to stochastic gradients in any case. So, you know, they can, there can be a bit of uh, stochastic error around them. And one way you can do this is just saying, well, you have some fixed theta in RD. You create IID copies of the noise that you make yourself. Um, you solve iteratively many, many times this optimization problem. This is if you want to find a solution very accurately, it's not always necessary. Uh, and you just average it all. You will have an unbiased estimate of this by just taking the average of all these solutions. Right, so this is, uh, as Marco would say, uh, embarrassingly uh, parallelizable. You can uh, solve it, uh, you can solve it in uh, many, many different machines. There's no communication uh, needed, and if you want to be a tiny bit smart, what you can do is you can uh, solve first for theta. You, can, you will have Y star theta, because in many, solu in many situations, what will happen is that if you add a bit of noise, you won't actually change the solution, or you will change it only a little bit, and this warm start will be very useful. Just a tiny detail. So we have some estimates of Y, and because, so I think this was, few slides before, yeah, because the derivatives of Y are also given with these expectations that depend on the solution and the noise, you can also do the same tricks. We have other integration by parts formula for other derivatives, but you can do the same tricks always. Just take empirical averages of a lot of perturbed solutions that you've created yourself. Okay, so. This is a little bit of the, you know, why is this useful and how do we make it useful? How am I doing on time? Good. Okay. Good, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this was, this was saying that um, whatever the loss you have at the end of your machine learning pipeline, you know, all method can, with very few modifications, uh, be transformed, uh, so transform your model into something that's completely end-to-end -end differentiable, et cetera. Uh, however, so one of my, uh, when we were looking at this, one of my colleagues uh, at uh, Google, with whom we started at the same time, so Mathieu Blondel will be here, I think, soon, uh, mentioned that this looked a lot like something like that he, uh, he had worked on in the previous year. Uh, that is a family of losses called the Fenchel-Young losses based on duality, um, that is very useful in structured prediction. So what, what is this loss? So if you, if you look at uh, this term here, so if you, look at as a, if you look at this as a function of y in C, uh, this is a function of y, this is the opposite of the contour lines I drew here that were maximized at uh, y star, right? So this term, is uh, minimized this time at y star, and the value that uh, y star epsilon, and the value that it's taking is f epsilon, right? So this means that if you look at it on the right hand side, this is minimized at uh, y star epsilon of theta with value zero. And because of this nice map that we have uh, on the other side, this means that uh, for a fixed y now, if you look at this function in theta, this will be a convex function in theta, and that will be minimized at theta such that uh, the projection explains well some data y that you've seen. Right, so no projection, but a, a map that we have, right? So we have this map that takes a theta, right? So this is y epsilon star, which is the gradient of uh, f epsilon, and what this loss does is that it takes the theta such that uh, this theta is sent 
to um, something close to y that we observe. Right, and it has value zero in this case. It's actually equal to the Bregman divergence between the y that's observed and y epsilon uh, star. Okay, so this might be a lot to digest, but essentially you can think of it as something that is a function of theta directly. It makes the link between a theta that would make sense for an observation yi that you've seen, right? Another nice property that it has is that because theta and y only interact with each other uh, linearly, if you have a random y, then essentially the expectation goes in the middle, and so you have nice properties uh, on expectation of a empirical loss and the fact that it's minimized at the right value. So in particular, what this means is that, you know, if you have some unknown theta zero, right, so I'll explain this in a bit more detail at uh, the next slide, but, you know, the statistician in me thinks, you know, if you have, uh, if you have some unknown theta zero here, so there's some unknown uh, costs for travel on each edge, and uh, every person has, you know, uh, every person that comes in has some estimate of the cost and then solves uh, this problem, right? So you observe a bunch of yi and you would like to figure out what costs generate this behavior, right? What true unknown theta generate the behavior that I'm observing in the yi's, right? This is like a generalization of uh, logistic regression. You have some discrete observations that you have that are at the extreme points of a polytope. It doesn't need to be just at the end of the minus one, one segment. And you want to understand what theta zero generates this behavior. You have, if you minimize with uh, your observations uh, this loss, in expectation, what you have is something uh, that will be minimized at the true theta zero. So this is extremely useful to have some nice uh, statistical properties, and this will be the subject of the next slide. And finally, we have some very, very convenient gradients. So this is one of the beauties of these losses. If you take the gradient in theta of this loss, right, which is always what you want to do in a machine learning pipeline, then no Jacobian in uh, y epsilon of theta shows up. It's just y epsilon of theta star minus y. And again, this will be equal to zero when these two things are close to each other, right? So this loss is trying to take theta such that this is close to our observations, again. And algorithmically, this makes things a lot easier, right? So what we're saying is now, if, you know, within the same framework, saying, you know, we had some thetas, we have a soft maximizer, uh, with this soft maximizer, we have a loss. If we're saying now, you know, there's a particular loss, this sort of Bregman divergence between this soft maximizer and uh, Y, that allows us to virtually bypass the soft optimization block. We just have a loss, you know, so now this is this special young loss between the costs or you know, log it or whatever you want to call them, theta, and the observed Y. This is easier to implement. If we take gradients of this, it only depends on Y epsilon, no, no, it's Jacobian. And if your data is generated from a model, from our perturb generative model, then the loss, the population loss is minimized at the ground truth, which is also something that you want statistically. Okay. So here, just to develop a bit more what happens, so if we are in a statistical problem, right? So if we have Y1 to Yn that are IID copies, right? So this can be, you know, uh, users that rank movies. Movies overall across the population have some sort of, you know, uh, average score, and each user has scores that are, that are, you know, slightly different for all these movies. Gives you their vectors of ranking, YN, Y1 to YN. We want, just from these discrete observations, these discrete optimal behavior, to understand the unknown, to estimate the unknown theta zero. So here, so we have, you know, in some sense, we have some sort of histogram in red uh, of, um, of, these, um, of this distribution, of this distribution P theta zero, and we want to estimate the theta zero. Um, so here, this Fenchel-Young loss, right, so here there should be an epsilon, gives us a nice way 
uh, to minimize, a nice empirical loss to minimize. It's a little bit like, uh, for those who are uh, familiar with this, like inference in, uh, in Gibbs models. We have an average of these uh, functional young losses. They have a very convenient stochastic gradient. So if, if we are at value theta, we're just looking at the soft maximizer in theta minus yi. <clears throat> so again, in the example of ranking, you would do, you know, this would be a soft rank that corresponds to the vectors, to the current uh, vector of scores theta that you're estimating. So you have some soft ranks that are some averages of vectors of rank, and you're taking the soft rank minus the new rank of the user. And that's it, that's, that's your stochastic gradient. Um, and up to an additive constant, this is the same as you know, taking the loss between theta and the averages of all the ranks. And in expectation, this is the same as taking the loss between theta and the population average rank. And again, so we have in these, uh, in these situations, no, not only for ranks, but for any uh, convex polytope, results in asymptotic normality of this minimizer theta hat n around theta zero. Right? This is again because it minimizes a strictly uh, convex objective. Okay, and we can do the same thing in supervised learning, so I'm gonna have some examples in the experiments uh, right after this. So if we're essentially, if we're motivating our setting by saying, you know, the yi that I'm observing, they correspond to some logits theta that are outputted by a true vector, right? So there's a you know, true natural vector, you know, philosophically you can justify this however you want, uh, you know, someone's brain, et cetera. Uh, that output something like this with a bit of noise. This is how the yi uh, is generated. Uh, then you can say, you know, this motivates really well a setting where you're taking a, this functional young loss between output, outputted scores and observation y. And again, here the stochastic gradients are very easy to compute. At least the part that's a stochastic gradient in theta will again just be, you know, soft maximizer in the outputs of the neural network minus the observation yi. And this is something that you can simulate by a doubly stochastic scheme. Right? This itself is the expectation of something else. Right? So you can take the forward pass of your model, gw of xi, add some perturbation, solve it. This gives you uh, something that has the right expectation, and you subtract yi, and you have an a stochastic estimate of your stochastic gradient. Okay. Part of the stochasticity comes from the data, part of the stochasticity comes from your own randomness that you've added to do Monte Carlo estimates of this. Okay, so now the fun part, uh, some experiments. So we actually didn't do this with the pictures of the organizers, but with uh, the Cypher 10 data set uh, that has so 10 classes, so I think, you know, bird, truck, horse, etc. Uh, and this was just, you know, kind of a toy model. We know that, you know, it's already possible to solve this sort of, you know, max, uh, max problem uh, in theta with a soft max layer. So we, we were wondering, you know, what happens if instead of doing a soft max layer on a very simple uh, convolutional ne neural network, we replace uh, the Kirchner entropy, right, which is equivalent to taking the soft max by the Fenchel Young loss. So we found that essentially we get similar performance. Uh, funnily enough, so we haven't really understood why, but the uh, large M, so the number, of, uh, the number of perturbations that you do yourself to approximate these stochastic gradients don't really play a role. It doesn't matter really if you do one or 1,000 or five. So we don't really understand why. Maybe essentially it's stochastic enough to begin with that you know, trying to compute it very accurately doesn't really change anything. Um, but uh, epsilon plays a big role, right? So the amount, funny enough, the amount of noise that you add plays a big role. If you don't add enough epsilon, you haven't smoothed at all uh, your loss landscape and essentially nothing moves, there's an optimal epsilon to add uh, that, you know, makes uh, the training and test loss quite small and then if epsilon keeps uh, increasing, then essentially you're just, you know, you're just putting noise in your model. There's too much perturbation and it doesn't really work anymore. And what we observed is that, so yeah, in terms of training and testing accuracy, it works uh, just like cross-entropy. 
Um, another thing that we uh, created, so we, we didn't really find a really, really great data set, so this is something we're going to work on, but essentially a data set that had nice instances and ranks of these instances. So you know there's a learning to rank data set, but it's, uh, it has some issues. And so what we did is we created our own. Uh, we just said, you know, you can put a lot of, it, it's very toy, but you can, you know, put a lot of vectors in dimension D, project them along an unknown direction, W0, and then rank them, right? So one, two, three, four, et cetera. Uh, then what you show to the model is just the position of the blue points and their relative order, right? So this vector ordered from, uh, in this case, I think, uh, one to eight. Uh, and so the idea is that if we show a lot of these examples with the same unknown W0, eventually uh, the model should understand along which direction we're projecting and be able to predict ranks on future instances, right? So this is kind of a you know, simulated data set for learning to rank. Um, what we also wanted to do is introduce a little bit of robustness to noise, right? So we said, you know, the data itself can be generated from, you know, ranks or, you know, optimal de decisions that are a bit noisy, that are not, you know, perfect <coughs> given, the, uh, given, the, uh, given the scores. So what we did is we, you know, if you zoom in here, these are quite close, so six, five, and four. We added a bit of variance here, which means, you know, after projection, we let the scores move a little bit, right? So this corresponds to adding some uh, sigma z to our theta, the theta are the projections here. Uh, and this changes a little bit uh, the ranks, right? So here you have the true ranks along this projection, and here you have the ranks with a bit of noise. Right, so we give the blue points and the noisy ranks uh, as data set, and we try from this to learn W0 to recover uh, the ranks on on future instances. Okay, and so what we've observed, so this is an experiment where we had, so, you know, 4,000 instances where every time we, we rank 100 vectors, right, so, which means that the perfect rank means, you know, you, you know exactly uh, from one to 100 which are the ranks of your, uh, of your vectors uh, that were ranking in dimension nine. Uh, and so what we observed, of course, is that the more noise you add, uh, the more this becomes a problem. So, you know, if you have small amounts of noise, uh, you're able to recover either the perfect or partial ranks, right? So partial ranks are just the, the uh, proportion uh, that, are in the right, uh, that are in the right position. And as theta increases, then this becomes harder and harder until eventually you're, you know, you're not able to predict anymore because you know, garbage in, garbage out. Um, and in this case, the Fenchel Young loss is convex in W, what you're trying to minimize is here. So we didn't do this here, but here this is a linear model and there could be a possible theoretical analysis of you know, how much sigma can you tolerate before this goes away. And I have one last slide. So this was uh, so an experiment that was in another paper that we uh, reproduced. So what happens is we don't show to the network this part. We just show to the network a lot of features and a lot of solutions of shortest path, right? So this is a data set that's already been created and we verified that the shortest path are actually true shortest path given the hidden costs. And what we did, so using these, uh, sorry, using these perturbed uh, shortest path, uh, we minimized, uh, again, with a simple uh, convolutional ne neural network uh, with a fenchel young loss, uh, these, uh, these parameters, and what we're able to do at the end is to show it true um, new images and to predict the, uh, the optimal shortest path because essentially it was able to uh, predict the cost. So here again, it's an example of a situation when you're able to do supervised learning of an unknown cost based on a discrete optimal uh, behavior. And this graph just shows, so we did this experiment for various levels of uh, perturbation epsilon, that for the right value of perturbation epsilon, with very few epochs, you're able to find the optimal, uh, the optimal path, right? So this measures the suboptimality of the path. And so this is something uh, that we did in this example. We're looking to do it on you know, more real life example, and this is something that can be also uh, 
exported to uh, any discrete optimal decision, not only shortest path or rankings. And thanks a lot for your attention. <laughs>